This talk will approach questions of Jewish identity and Jewish cultural history through the prism of translation. It will show the usefulness of translation for understanding how the two major Jewish centers of our time, in Israel and America, formed their perceptions of each other mainly in the 1950s through the 1980s. I will focus on the ideological mediation involved in this transfer, the ideological aspects, some quite visible, others hidden from sight, in the translation between these Jewish cultures, the two most significant centers of world Jewry since the mid-20th century. The first part of the talk will offer a glance at the so-called westward-bound tra textual transfer, that is, the translation of Hebrew literature in America, en route to its mainly target, uh, Jewish target audience there, uh, here, in the, uh, during these decades. And this part will focus on ideological manipulations in translation, on the filter or sieve that adjusted and changed these texts in ways that conforms, conformed to tenets of American Jewish identity during the decades in question. The second part of the talk will deal with translation in the other direction of transfer, that of Jewish American literature into Israeli culture. Here, I will explore a different channel of mediation, not what happened to the actual texts, but what was said about the meaning of their translation, that is, the meta-translational discourse, the public and intellectual understanding of translation between homeland and diaspora, how it was perceived and conceived. And as we'll see, that too played a part in framing Jewish American literature and culture for its Israeli readers. So because of my limited time, I'll have to present my findings today uh, with only a select number of examples. Um, and also, it should be noted that my talk focuses on the ideological and political, uh, which necessarily reduces Hebrew literature and its translation to one of its many aspects. Um, to me, it seems interesting and important, but I'm surely not implying that this is the only way to approach the subject. There are linguistic, stylistic approaches to translation, of course, as well. But what I do hope to show, and what I hope that these examples will help us see, is that within this framework of translation, of cultural exchange, the self-definition of one Jewish center would be shaped in response, in reaction, to the challenge of the alternative, at times competing, Jewish center across the ocean. And I will elaborate on this. Because we should remember it was not only the agents, the writers, translators, critics, who are mainly Jewish in this case study, as well as the bulk of the readership. In other words, it was not only the sociological context of translation that was largely Jewish. Rather, the Jewish significance of this encounter can also be seen in a broader, more conceptual manner. Why is this so? Because in both directions of transfer, the text that was translated belonged to a corpus that had been conceptualized as Jewish. It was perceived as carrying Jewish traits in both academic and public discourse. Now, this kind of essentialism could, of course, be problematized, but the fact remains that Hebrew literature and Jewish American literature have been widely perceived as associated with the two Jewish communities. And indeed, each literature deals with key issues in the history and identity of the two groups. Therefore, the translation and transfer of the texts to their new audience could be framed as a juncture or crossroads between two Jewish cultures, a dialogue of sorts or negotiation of ideas between two platforms of Jewish identity. And in fact, this is not in any way unique to the 20th century. Throughout the long span of Jewish history, translation filled an important role in the transfer of ideas and values between Jewish groups. By crossing boundaries of language and space, the practice of translation provided an obvious means for bridging, both symbolically and practically, the linguistic and geographic gaps between uh, dispersed Jewish communities that no longer shared a common language. From the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Torah for the Jews of Hellenistic Alexandria, to Targum Onkelos for the Aramaic-speaking Jews residing in Babylon. In the Middle Ages, we have Yuda Levi and Maimonides, who were translated from Arabic to Hebrew, 
connecting the Arabic-speaking communities of North Africa and Islamic Spain to communities living in Christian regions of southern France and northern Italy. In the twilight of the Ottoman Empire, works of the Jewish Enlightenment were translated from Hebrew and German to Ladino and from Ladino to Hebrew in Edirne, uh, Istanbul, and Jerusalem as part of the interchange between Ottoman and German Ascala movements. At the end of the 19th, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, the writings of Aram, Mapu, and other Ascala writers were translated from Hebrew or German to Ladino, to Judeo-Persian, and Judeo-Tunisian Arabic for the Jewish community of Tunisia, and more and more and more. Uh, in short, all throughout Jewish history, uh, communities separated by great distances and varying languages would not forego a meaningful connection and relied considerably on translation to that end. And one can think of the corpus that's examined here as yet another layer to this impressive tradition of intra-Jewish translation. Another thing that is exemplified uh, by this Jewish tradition is the centrality of the text. For centuries, a crucial site where core issues of Jewish identity were reflected negotiated and shaped was the text. As Victoria Ahrens recently remarked, writing itself for Jews has been the center, has been that center of gravity that has given weight and meaning to their lives. Story so storytelling itself, the still point in the turning world. As Amos Oz and Fania Oz Salzberger wrote, ours is not a bloodline, but a text line. The imperative condition, uh, and elsewhere, the imperative component or condition that defines us as a nation is rooted in books. And while this may be slightly exaggerated, there's also uh, much truth to it. Um, now, if in previous centuries, this mostly involved texts that can be termed somewhat anachronistically as religious, then one of the heirs of the religious text in the 20th century as a tribal uh, campfire or a symbolic communal anchor has been the literary text. And this is true for both the Israeli center and the American Jewish one. These communities, the two most prolific generators of Jewish texts in the 20th century, have bestowed an eminent status upon the literary text and assigned it collective meaning. Here we have Chaim Nachman Bialik uh, proclaiming that Hebrew literature has always filled the authoritative role of governing the spiritual world of the Hebrew audience, serving as a guide to the nation. And recently in a, um, a research book by Ezra Kapel, Jewish American literature is a primary centering force in the lives of American Jews after the Second World War. It is an American Talmud. And we can think of the controversy provoked by the publication of Amos Oz's my Michael, uh, my Michael in 1967, as leading critic Baruch Kurzweil stated that the character of Hannah Gonen was more dangerous to Israel than all of the Arab armies put together. Or the outraged reaction of the American Jewish establishment to Philip Roth's Portnoy's complaint when it was published. The recent 2015 uproar in response to the Ministry of Education in Israel, the decision of the Ministry of Education that All the Rivers by Dorit Rabinyan, which describes a relationship between a Jewish woman and a Palestinian in New York, would no longer be <coughs> part of the high school curriculum, indicates both the decision and the uh, public uproar, indicates that the social, the, the collective significance assigned to the literary text in Israeli discourse even if it diminished, it still remains. So why is this important? Because during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, this is the period that I study, but also to this day, the Jewish communities in Israel and America are um, the, the two primary sources of Jewish identity. Each of these societies offer possible answers to the question of what it means to be Jewish in the modern era. And as we all know, the answers to, uh, that these communities offer and the versions of Jewish identity that they represent vary to a great extent. They represent different concepts of nationalism, ethnicity, religion, different historical and social circumstances, different internal power struggles, different challenges in the past and the present. And the ways in which these communities have come to understand themselves and their role in the Jewish world also clearly differ. And this is precisely the reason for the potential of translation as a research paradigm. Because the significant differences between the communities found deep expression in their literary works, the translation and the transfer of works across cultures had to challenge each community 
with the otherness of its counterpart. This migration of texts from their home turf to a foreign field had to involve an encounter, sometimes a confrontation, between Jewish identities. Therefore, while dealing with the mediation of literary images and representations, a broader matter is always at hand, and presumably more is at stake. How do American Jews know what they think they know about Israel? How do Israelis know what they think they know about American Jews? How are perceptions formed and attitudes cultivated toward that other Jewishness, and to what ends? So, it is true, and I believe it is true, that by means of translation, a spiritual bridge is built between Israel and the Diaspora. However, as we will soon see, the reason why this cultural encounter is so intriguing also stems from some of the bridge's less connective features. And indeed, what I tried to ask is, what kind of bridge is this? Who shapes it? What are its ideological features? And what were they meant to achieve? So let me begin with a couple of examples. Like I said, we start with the English translation of Hebrew literature. And I should note that in my research, I studied different channels of mediation. Uh, the book reviews, the critical reception, the translations themselves, introductions to anthologies in translation, etc. But for lack of time, uh, I will focus here on interferences in the, actual in the actual text that were translated from Hebrew to English and published in America. So let's look at the following example from Yitzhak Benel's The Man From There in Dorothea Sheffer's 1970 translation. Now, what you see on the left is my literal translation. Uh, of the text, not how it actually appeared, which we will soon see. Um, so the novel takes place during the War of Independence, and here Ezra, uh, a Jewish boy who is living and hiding in an increasingly hostile uh, Egyptian town in the southern part of the country, uh, and is awaiting for its conquest by Israeli forces, cries out in the Hebrew. Um, back translated into English. The Egyptians are cowards and liars. They should be slaughtered, all of them. But Saul's soldiers will come and take this town. What do you mean by this um, which town? Um, the town that he's living in at the time, uh, that is, may soon be conquered. In translation, however, Ezra's feelings for hatred for the Arab enemy and its zealous expression are subdued. As the text, as you see, um, presents the reader with a more desirable or less aggressive image of the young Jewish boy. One finds similar interference elsewhere in the novel when the narrator attempts to flee the Egyptian town where he is hiding and cross the border into Israel. And here in the source text, the protagonist ex expresses an ambivalent view of his country and people. In the source text, he, he writes, the following evening I set off, my country, so painful to me, seemed so near and yet so far away, etc. In the actual English translation, it appeared like this. The following evening I set off. My country embattled, its existence threatened, its people, my people, facing enemies which wanted to chase them into the sea, <laughs> seemed so near and yet so far away. By leaving out the pain, painfulness that is part of the narrator's ambiguous feelings towards his country and adding a display of feeling of shared fate with his people, the translation reconstructs the narrator as emotionally involved in Israel's struggle for independence and less unsure of his own national identity than the source text. Another, another novel whose English translation presents a less ambiguous image of Israeli morals then the source text is Aaron Megid's The Living on the Dead, Achai al in Misha Lubish's 1971 translation. Here, the novel's narrator, Jonas, writes about legendary third Aliyah pioneer Davidov in the early settlement days and is part in the establishment of Upper Hanita in the Western Galilee. In the source text, in my faithful literal translation in Hebrew, it says, uh, it, it reads, there was a large stone house in Upper Hanita where Arab farmers dwelt. One day, Davidov suggested to take the place by force. Twenty men were brought up there, equipped with hose, hammers, barbed wire, sacks. They entered the inner yard and started to turn it into a stronghold, surrounding it with a fence and trenches and fixing its walls. The Arabs still would not leave, so all their things were taken out. 
the inhabitants and their possessions were mounted on donkeys and sent across the border. This was how Upper Hanita was conquered. In the translation, however, it reads like this. When Upper Hanita was taken, David, Davidov moved to the top of the hill. So it's clear that the translation presents Davidov and his fellow pioneers and Jewish settlement in mandatory Palestine in general as more ethically sound and less implicated in violence um, than the source text, as uh, the English passage was neatly stitched around the treatment of the Arab farmers. And by the way, the filter and translation can be in play before the translation itself. And one example for that is the non-translation into English for six decades of Sameh Izhar's canonical Khir Betchize. This seminal story, perhaps the most well-known in Israeli literary history, depicts the expulsion of Palestinians from the village, uh, from their village by an Israeli department in the 1948 uh, War of Independence. Nor was the story included in a published collection of Izhar's stories in English translation in 1969, despite its centrality and importance. And this is why uh, the, the literary and intellectual discourse in Israel, at least to some extent, did not shy away from uh, moral self-questioning and reckoning with um, Israeli wrongdoings uh, during the war. So uh, what is being protectively mediated here is how Israeli creative expression related to Israel's own history. Um, and of course, like uh, the other interferences that we've seen, this practice, this evasion, not only mirrors an ideological political orientation, but also reinforces it, participates in it. Um, another kind of interference or protective mediation was subduing the national pers perspective in the, in the literary representation of the Arab other in Hebrew literature. And this was done mainly by altering the Palestinian voice present or represented in the source Hebrew text. This is taken from uh, The Lover, a Mahev by uh, Aleph Bet Yoshua, um, another prominent Israeli uh, novelist, in one of the monologues by Naim, the Arab character, the Arab teenager character in the novel. So the source text reads, at first I really did sleep the whole journey and I used to reach the Jews really tired. He goes to work um, at a garage of a, a, a Jewish owner. And in translation, however, he did not, he does not, he's not, he does not used to reach the Jews really tired, but arrive at work really tired. So in Hebrew, Naim goes to the Jews and that's how his national identity, his self-perceived otherness, is presented. In English, he just goes to work. And all the inherent difference uh, in the representation of his character is lost. And we have another uh, in the, um, other part of the same monologue. Uh, I'll jump to the end. I never tire of this route, the same route day after day. Hour and a he describes his uh, going to work. You leave and enter Palestine, and it's always most pleasant on the way back, it reads in the Hebrew text. In the translation, the different way of naming the land is, is uh, left out as the representation of names character uh, is moderated. Um, and by the way, another strategy that served the translation to diminish Arab otherness in the text was to leave out instances of the Arabic language from the text. So in the source text, Yoshua incorporated Arabic uh, phrases in the body of the text amongst the Hebrew, with a footnote translating it, translating it for the Hebrew reader. In English, however, the Arabic language with its uh, symbolic presence, these manifestations of a different national identity, are gone, either left untranslated or translated into English following he said in Arabic, which is of course different than a transcription of the words in the body of the text. Another kind of uh, interferences in translation, not one that involves the moral image of Israel, had to do with Israel's symbolic boundaries vis-a-vis -vis its diaspora. And I mean the subdual of unfavorable representation of world Jewry. So here in uh, Amnon Jacon's political thriller Borrowed Time, the translation interferes with a uh, uh, critical depiction of diaspora Jews for not living in Israel and not sharing the load of Zionism. In the source text, Arik, uh, a Mossad agent, speaks painfully about his leaving Israel and compares himself to uh, his friend who stayed. And Catherine answers, 
he says, I, the deserter, ran away. Um, his uh, Palestinian lover, Catherine, answers that just like he ran away, so did half a million Israelis and several million Jews who live in other countries. That's not the same. It is. It's exactly the same. So it appears in the source text. Um, this part was, however, omitted in translation. So um, <coughs> the portrayal of diaspora Jews in his terms as deserters is uh, omitted from the translation and the passage uh, stitched around it. One final example from this part is the English translation of David Shachal's His Majesty's Agent, and particularly the novel's character A.B. Drizzle. Shachal makes little effort to conceal that Drizzle is the mirror image of thinker and writer Elie Wiesel. He also does little to disguise what he thinks of him. From the outset, Drizzle is described in a particularly unfavorable light as a pompous and self-indulgent man in the source Hebrew text. Considering Wiesel's iconic status in the American Jewish community during uh, those years, and the way he is described in the novel, particularly against the backdrop, there's a scene there uh, that takes place in the Yom Kippur War, uh, an existential war in Israel. Shachal's, the, the writer's satirical tone can be perceived as a blunt critique of American Jewry as a whole. It's represented by its, uh, um, by Eli, the A.B. Drizzle, Elie Wiesel character in the novel. The American objects of this criticism, however, never faced it as it was written because um, the Wiesel, Drizzle in the Hebrew source was reincarnated uh, as a very different character on its way to the American audience. So first the character's name was changed from A.B. Drizzle to Jules Levy uh, in order to mask his true identity. Um, also, manipulations in the translated version systematically subdue um, the satire uh, of Wiesel. So paragraphs, sometimes entire pages ridiculing Wiesel in the original novel, novel were edited out. So this is just one instance of many. Uh, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, wants to bring Drizzle, Wiesel to Israel to uh, portray Israel in a, f uh, a favorable way in the States. But how could we recruit Abby Drizzle to our own cause? Such a spiritual leader costs a lot of money, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, alas, broke. For one lecture, if he concurs, Abby Drizzle asks for no less than $3,000. The more morally elevated the topic of the lecture, and the more spiritually taxing, the higher the fee. So, such interferences as we have seen here, these... Uh, manipulations that cushion different uh, difficult aspects of the quite self-critical or sometimes critical of other things Israeli texts um, that were meant to make them uh, more acceptable in terms of their political implications they prompt an inve inevitable set of questions who was it that introduced these uh, textual shifts who among the translators editors publishers uh, and even the authors who were sometimes uh, took part in the translation are responsible for the translation's final version and given that these translations were published decades ago, could we ever really know? Um, so when I asked the translators who were still alive in per personal correspondence about the shifts in their translations, they responded that they did not remember the details of the translation process, which had indeed taken place 30, 40 years ago, but they strongly believed that they did not introduce, of their own accord, any ideological alterations to the original texts. The authors who could be still be contacted, similarly, um, Oz, Yoshua, Meged, uh, all rejected the idea that they ever introduced changes for political considerations. My own intuition, based on this correspondence, is that the manipulations indeed occurred during the editorial process. But, admittedly, this can never be verified. Um, a peek behind the scenes of the American English, uh, um, an American English translation symposium from 2008, do I have that? No. Um, reveals uh, a way of thinking that supports this uh, intuition. Because in this symposium, the copy editors are, are urged to treat the text as if it was a source text, not as a translation. To edit it freely as if they had uh, um, the text in its first uh, manifestation. Um, and there's even... Um, one copy editor or one editor that, that says beware of politically charged uh, uh, references to 
uh, Kurdistan or Israel and the Palestinian territories. So there's an explicit uh, note in this symposium that goes hand in hand with some of the uh, interferences that we see in translation and support the intuition that it happened in the editorial stage. Admittedly, we can never really know. Now, before we analyze these phenomena, let us put uh, this filter on images and representations from Israel in a little uh, broader historical perspective. Uh, it's important to say a few words on the place and status of Hebrew literature in American culture in recent decades. Even though the number of Hebrew speakers is very small, Hebrew is not among the hundred most spoken languages in the world. According, according to UNESCO, Hebrew literature is the sixth most translated into English in the United States, following the major European languages and preceding important and widely spoken languages such as Arabic, Jap Japanese, and Chinese. And indeed, in a paper from... Um, oh, here it is. I'll read it quickly. The editor of the translation should look at the overall book, not the translation, and edit it as an original book. Or copy editors have to look for, an, for unacceptable or controversial usage. Thorny issues might be references to Israel and the, uh, Palestine, the occupied territories, or Kurdistan being referred to as a country. So it supports our intuition. Um, back to uh, a paper from 1991, literary scholar Robert Alter wrote that the presence that Hebrew literature has achieved in English translation in the past two decades constitutes one of the great literary success stories of our time. By the 1980s, it had become the most visible foreign literature in the United States after that of Latin America. Now, even if Alter's views are not based on statistical data and were possibly prompted by his own heartfelt wishes, there is still much truth in his claim regarding the relatively unique position that Hebrew literature obtained in the American literary scenes uh, from during these decades, uh, in both translation and critical reception. And this is especially in light of the traditional unreceptiveness of the American literary market to translation and import from foreign cultures. And when we try to explain this somewhat disproportionate status, we can refer to different uh, factors, but it seems that the main reason uh, for what Alter called one of the great literary success stories of our times, um, at least dur during the decades in dis under discussion, has to do with the American Jewish readership and perhaps the presence of American Jewish agents that are interested in Israeli literature on the American literary scene. And this is largely accepted by whoever has written on the subject. So we may assume that the changes, the interferences that we've seen in the text were done, at least to some extent, with the American Jewish reader in mind. Or at the very least, it makes sense to try to understand the meaning of these interferences within the framework of the American Jewish affinity to Israel during the decades in question. So in light of this, how did the images of Israel absorbed by American Jewish readers through the filter of translation connect to their own identity? W what can be understood from these manipulations in translation? Um, so this point is extremely relevant to the decades that I deal with, uh, particularly the years after the 1967 Six-Day War, about 15 years to the mid-1980s, because these years may have been the climax of what some historians have called the Zionization of American Jews. During these years, as put by Ted Solotarov, Israel may have been the main ingredient, the paramount source of Jewish identity in America, something that would change in later years. So. Of course, we can understand these findings as practical efforts to defend Israel's image in the eyes of not only Jewish American readers, but also American readers at large. But at the same time, we can also try to understand them in a deeper sense, in the context of internal American Jewish discourse and its own need during these years to produce a certain image of Judaism in which Israel plays a constituent role. We must remember that American Jewish speaker, thinkers spoke of Israel in these years as fulfilling a quasi-religious role in American Jewish life. Israel itself was described as the religion of American, Jewish, American Jews during these years. And so, being that Israel was expected to be a mainstay of communal American Jewish identity, and that this American Jewish identity draws deeply on an ethical dimension, a moral imperative, then the less flattering or more pro problematic images of Israel had to be appropriated in translation so it could fill this quasi-religious role. 
In other words, I suggest that this aspect of English translation of Hebrew literature that we've seen, these interferences, uh, these adjustments, these alterations, could perhaps be understood as part of a reinforcement of Jewish American identity, the target culture audience. An, uh, a reinforcement of an identity in which images of Israel played a major role at the time. So, to this point, we've discussed the mediated transfer of Israeli text into the American literary field. Now, in the time I have left, uh, I'd like to take a look at the other direction, the translation of Jewish American literature in Israel. And here we'll look at another important channel of mediation that influences this migration of text, that frames the meaning that they are assigned in the receiving target culture. And I mean the intellectual and public discourse, the book reviews, editorials, and the like. As translation scholar Lawrence Venuti argued, very much along the lines of Gidon Turi's concept of translation norms, every step in the translation process, from the selection of foreign text to the development and implementation of translation strategies to the editing and reviewing of translations, is mediated by the diverse cultural vi values that circulate in the target language, always in some hierarchical order. So here, in this part of the talk, we'll relate to Venuti's last form of mediation, the reviews and literary discourse. And within the literary discourse, I'd like to focus on the discourse about translation, meta-translational discourse on the transfer of texts between Jewish cultures. Just like in migration proper, one can learn a lot not only from how immigrants were treated, but also from how immigrant was dis immigration was discussed, uh, conceptualized. Similarly, we can learn a lot not only from how the texts were treated, what we've seen in the first half of the uh, presentation, but also from how translation was discussed, the so-called migration of text, how it was framed, how translation was conceptualized, and we'll see how. So let's start with two instances from the late 1950s. Uh, these were years when um, more and more thought was given uh, in Israel to the importance of translation to and from Hebrew as a necessary means for the growth of a thriving Israeli culture. So, for instance, in an introduction to an Israeli anthology of Jewish authors who wrote in languages other than Hebrew, Baruch Karu writes, and everything here was translated, uh, appeared in Hebrew and was translated by me from Hebrew. In our vision, the day will come when every Jewish author in a foreign tongue will recognize the obligation to translate his works into Hebrew, to give back what was stolen, as Maimonides wrote to his translator. So Karu describes the translation as a, re as a way to return something lost to its rightful original owner. In a way, he appropriates the translation into Hebrew, existing translations as well as future translations, uh, to the National Israeli Project. This assertion that somewhat diminishes the value and validity of Jewish texts written in languages other than Hebrew echoes the worldview of earlier Zionist thinkers like Echad Ha'am and national poet Bialik, who claimed, this is in the context of the struggles between Yiddish and Hebrew several decades earlier, that any Jewish works whose, values, whose value merits survival throughout the ages will survive in Hebrew translation alone. Everything else will be lost and forgotten as if it had never existed, just as Yiddish will. This is Echad Ha'am and Bialik. Our roots, our foundation, lay solely in Hebrew. Any Jewish literature created in foreign tongues is of no existence to us unless it is translated into Hebrew. Um, and it's interesting to see that Hebrew thought on translation in the other direction, that is, from Hebrew into other tongues used by Jewish diasporas, similarly reflected this hierarchical conception of Israel as culturally preeminent to diaspora Jewry. And this is perhaps revealing, among other things, uh, the cultural insecurities of the uh, fledgling new state. This is, a, the, um, I'm going to show something from the uh, late 50s. As Israel Cohen, the literary critic and essayist, wrote, the majority of our people living in the diaspora are bound to assimilate into the culture of Amaaretz. It is thus necessarily necessary to translate the finest Hebrew works that have appeared and continue to appear in high literature, intellectual thought, and science for their sake, so that they can relish them, even if it is only in their foreign tongue. And he continues and writes, Becoming familiar with these works would amplify their self-consciousness and sense of nationhood, even as spiritual elements forged in the Israeli foundry are imprinted in their soul. 
In this fashion, a Jewish fortitude will be infused in them and they will be able to weather the gusty winds. Um, so Cohen would, would later act on this claim and go on to co-found the Seminal Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature, which would, would indeed have historical impact on the dissemination of Hebrew literature abroad. But what's important to us in this essay is that he attributes to the Hebrew language the utmost importance in the making of Jewish identity in Herderian fashion, or rather in the footsteps of Bialik, who himself followed Herder. And this entails a clear hierarchical order between Jewish literature written in Hebrew and Jewish literature written in other tongues. It's al also evident from Cohen's hope that the translated source will awaken many of its readers and speed them toward the source itself, leading them to imbibe it not with a borrowed vessel, but with a Hebrew one. The translation is, th is thus conceived as a bridge between cultures, but the face of the bridge is not at all leveled, but rather inclined. Its slope descends from Israel to the diaspora. It makes us recall the charged uh, migration concepts in Hebrew, aliyah, meaning ascent when you immigrate to Israel, and yerida, meaning descent when you emigrate from Israel, which of course bears strong ideological connotations. So for Cohen, this conceptualization seems relevant to the migration of texts as well not only people. In other words, the linguistic cultural bridge of translation, so Cohen implies, descends from Israel to the di diaspora or ascends from the diaspora to Israel. And we find this even more explicitly in author and critic Ehud Ben Ezer's review, who writes about the Hebrew translation of Jewish authors from the diaspora. He writes in 1980, the translation into Hebrew sometimes serves as a restoration of sorts, whereby the works return to their common Jewish origin and are thus granted something of a redemption. It seems to me that only in Hebrew a kind of Jewish literary pantheon is being brought into existence. We can uh, replace the word text with the word person and then we have the ethos of the ingathering of exiles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, different authors living and writing in the diaspora, when they're translated, appear to constitute one literature and belong to one another perhaps more than to the literature of the language in which their works uh, were written. Now, this was written several years after Saul Bellow and Beshevi Zinger won the Nobel Prize for Literature, not long after Philip Roth and Bernard Malamud won the National Book Award. In short, when Jewish American literature enjoyed great symbolic and cultural capital worldwide. Um, and it's also a time of social unrest and cultural insecurity in Israel. And so again, it may betray uh, some insecurities on the part of the Israeli critic. But more important to us is the intellectual tradition that we are outlining here. The Hebrew language is portrayed as a medium that can not only uh, por uh, provide a home for individual works, for meandering individual works, but can also actually create a collective Jewish corpus, a solid collecti collective Jewish corpus out of them, a corpus that had not previously existed or was not previously a collective one, so it is implied. And this brings to mind Bialik's earlier uh, advocacy for the idea of kinus, gathering of Jewish spiritual treasures in Hebrew translation. Bialik writes, when Jewish lit literature in foreign languages is connected to the Hebrew language, it is once again connected to the living. With the introduction of new materials, so too will Hebrew's container expand. Um, and, uh, well, this is in Schleiermacher fashion. Um, uh, so too will Hebrew's container expand and we will no longer have separate national and non-national Jewish literatures. The language will nationalize all that comes into it and all that is contained within its borders. Um, incidentally, Bialik suggested an understanding of translation in the other direction of as well from Hebrew that, has, that uh, had ideological implications. So he writes, to employ a foreign tongue, to know Judaism in translation alone is like kissing one's mother through a veil. He's so chaste, right? Kissing a, the mother. Um, of course, this is the Yishuv in 1935. <laughs> Um, in any case, this conception was later adopted and used by uh, Israeli thinkers such as Gershon Shaked and Aleph Bet Yoshua in their polemics with Jewish diaspora culture. Um, but back to our more uh, contemporary meta-translational discourse, we can see again how rever reviewer Ehud Ben Ezer cast the Hebrew translation of Jewish text in the appropriating terms of the Israeli ethos of Kibbutz Galuyot, the gathering of exiles. 
I do not think there is any language in the world today like Hebrew into which so many works of Jewish authors not originally written in Hebrew have been translated. In this respect, we are the center into which, into which Jewish cultural production in all its tongues is gathered. Um, note how, uh, yeah, we have this uh, discussion in terms of redemption through Aliyah. The texts migrate, uh, make Aliyah as they are translated into Hebrew. Uh, they return to their common origin and are redeemed, uh, just like in the Zionist ethos. And uh, the implication that Ben Ezel tries to convey of uh, linguistic cultural hierarchy between the Israeli center and the American Jewish center is clear. One final point, and this is really my last one, is that some of the discussions that tended to express a patronizing or hierarchical approach by Israeli critics to American Jewish culture were at the same time quite sympathetic to the translated American Jewish works and authors and full of admiration for their achievements. In fact, they could sometimes express the most genuine affinity to American Jewish life and a sense of shared common fate. It was truly enmeshed. Um, and let's, let's look at one example for this, an excerpt from an Israeli review of Bellow's novel Herzog that takes uh, the utmost pride in the American Jewish writer, but nevertheless includes implicit appropriation of him. So he conclu this concludes a really glowing review of Herzog. And he states, I'll read the important part, the Jewish state was established, and as the Jewish state was established, at the very same time, the Jewish man of letters around the world has begun to speak his mind, and not only as an author, but as a Jew, with full consciousness of his uniqueness. The Jewish state is perhaps the sound box of the Jewish writer's voice in the world that gives his voice its power. So it is implied by uh, Barzel, the critic, that diaspora literary achievements and the urge and ability of American writers to write a Jewish work do not really have an independent uh, existence. They are dependent on Israel, it is implied, in a way they derive from it. And so it is only logical that he concludes, a sad thought pierces the heart. Why don't Shaul Bello, he writes Saul Bello all throughout the rest of the uh, review, but here, here it's personal. <laughs> Shaul Bello and his peers come home to the nation's homeland to forge the conceptual weaponry and armor of the Jewish soul. And like I said, this is in a review that celebrates and takes pride in Bellow's genius and contextualizes it first and foremost in Jewish terms. So there's an unsolved tension between these inclinations. And this unsolved tension may reflect something broader about the Israeli attitude to the American diaspora, an attitude which moved from affinity and appreciation and fascination to dismissal and intense friction. And actually, this is not as strange as it may seem. In fact, one attitude may be thought of as a point of departure, as a precondition of sorts to the other. Were it not for a basic assumption of affinity to American Jews, one would not find expressions of intense competition and criticism in the Israeli literary discourse, but rather indifference. If diasporic Jewish culture and life were not deemed deeply <coughs> relevant, one would not find an energetic Israeli Zionist grapple with them in the literary discourse. Therefore, the expressions of cultural competition that we find actually also attest to the relevance, the significance of American Jewish uh, expressive creation in the Israeli discourse. And this is true in the other direction as well. If there was no affinity to Israeli culture, no reliance on Israel during the decades in question, the English translation of Hebrew literature and its mediation to American Jewish audience would not necessarily implement the manipulations that we've seen. It will not feel the need to. So it is this filter and mediation that we see, this censorship and self-censorship in both directions of textual transfer that attests to the fact that these two competing Jewish centers from both sides of the ocean never cease to see each other as a significant point of reference to their divergent collective identities.